Are you searching for purpose of life? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World. When I was 18 years old, I went to Poland for World Youth Day and I heard a story that, that left me in tears about a man who had a traumatic thing happen to him in his life. Rather than feel sorry for himself, he did something about it so that no one else have to experience something like that. Um, this man has had a profound impact on my life and he continues to do that here in Sydney and we're super blessed to have him on another slice of pizza. Chris Lee, thank you for coming. I'm so glad that you're here. Thanks so much for having me, Zach. How are you it's doing? Good to be. Yeah, good, good, good. I know we've had a few different changes in our plans, but it's so good to be with you. Um, I think we met a few years ago just when I um, took on the role in Sydney and yep. you were here for the net team. Yep. And um, I was really impressed by your um, leadership skills because I think you were the leader of the team at that time along with um, Danielle. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, it's so great to be able to catch up with you now again. Yeah, it was a great team. It was it was great to be in Sydney. Like you guys did some awesome things then. You've continued to do so. Like, Thanks. what's your role in the Sydney Diocese? So my role is um, I'm the team leader of Sydney Catholic Youth. But one of the other projects I manage is called Sumner House, which is the House of the Sermon in the Archdiocese of Sydney. So in regards to my role with um, Sydney Catholic Youth, the main spaces that we work in is leadership and evangelisation. So the way that we um, see ourselves working is to be able to form our leaders so that they may be able to be equipped. So ultimately, we want to raise up an empowered generation of young disciples who love Christ and through that love feel moved to be able to go out and evangelise and meet other young people and really share that gift of faith, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's been an amazing ride. It's been amazing for years. I got the job when I was 23 and I'm 27 now. Um, so I've really loved um, my time in Sydney and working with Archbishop Anthony is great as well. He's a good man. Yeah, lovely. And because I guess the reason you're so passionate about sharing that gift of faith with other young people is because it had a, a huge impact on your life and, and that's sort of something that you shared at World Youth Day. Do you want to share about what, just briefly what that looked like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I um, never ever thought that I would end up working for the church. It wasn't something that I kind of set my career goals out to be able to achieve. I probably wasn't someone that was super practicing as well through my teenage years. I came from a Catholic family, um, but I, as time went on and as I went through my teenage years, I started questioning faith and started moving further away from it. Had a few things happening with my family. Um, my dad was pretty sick from the age of um, my teenage years. So from about the age of 14, um, my life pretty much looked on the weekends of um, working to help mum pay the bills and then also I'm going into the city to be able to go visit my dad who was sick at the time. So this um, led me down a path then after high school, which I thought I'd end up joining um, the Australian Defence Force Academy, which is a university. Um, and it was a lot of work that I put into it. Um, but throughout this time, um, it was 2012, uh, the year after I finished, and um, it was the Easter long weekend. And my mum pulls me aside and um, says, you know, Chris, you should go to Mass um, with Easter. And I thought, no, I'm not going to mass. I don't want anything to do with the church. Um, so then I went out with my mates to a party. And then long story short, um, it just rolled into something where um, it was just supposed to be a barbecue, but we went out, had a really big night, had a few drinks. And then as the night rolled on, um, I had multiple chances to be able to exit out of the night and what was happening. But looking back on it now, I wasn't probably strong enough for myself to be able to um, turn away from that life. So as an 18 year old, just following the crowd and um, going out, drinking, partying. And then that night um, we got into the city and um, we were on William Street, got into the nightclub and then came back out and it was me and two of my mates and we weren't let back in because uh, we had too much to drink. So um, we walked up to my cousin's bar, which is 200 metres up the road, which is like a five minute walk from William Street. And um, on the way up, there was another group of guys walking down towards us. A fight broke out. One of the guys turned around and um, started following us. And the next thing I remember um, was the ambulance and then being taken to hospital. And then the next day, um, waking up in um, hospital and then the nurse coming in with a wheelchair and saying, Chris, jump in the wheelchair. We're going to take you down to see the ophthalmologist. So the ophthalmologist is kind of like the eye specialist. Mm -hmm. So um, 
they took me down to see the eye specialist and um, the eye specialist explained to me um, that um, what I didn't know at the time is that when I turned around to get back into the fight, one of the guys was um, carrying a knife. So I was um, cut through the eye on the left side and um, I had to have this eye stitched up. They managed to actually retain it so I was able to keep it. Um, but now it led to me being permanently blind in my eye, this side, and um, having three metal plates put on the right side of my face as well. Now, in saying that I was away from my faith, I really wasn't a bad kid. Like, I was one of the school captains at school when I finished. Um, I was really um, friends with a lot of different people. Um, so it was really embarrassing when it happened because I think a bit of me was embarrassed um, because I was an 18-year-old and I wasn't able to go out because of um, risk of infection, wasn't able to drive, wasn't able to go to university. So my life was pretty much just stopped and I was just stuck. And... Um, Looking back on it now, it was kind of um, my first kind of COVID period because I couldn't do anything and um, just literally under house arrest. And then my sister comes in one day and then there's a men's group starting out on the campus and um, she says um, she saw me moping around the house because this was about four months into my recovery. And she um, said, you know, Chris, there's a men's group starting up on my university campus. I think you should go. And then I said um, no like five times. And then she's persistent. She eh? is very <laughs> persistent, very persistent. And that's the big thing. Like um, I, I am so um, motivated um, to be able to do my job and to be able to introduce other people to Jesus um, and not give up on it because there was someone that didn't give Did up on me. Mm-hmm. So anyways, I went to the men's group and then the first um, thing that they were doing because uh, I said yes to just um, kind of get Olivia to shut up and stop asking me. Yeah. was um, they were doing uh, Lectio Divina mm. and they were talking about faith. And this is the first time I'd ever experienced this in my life where God wasn't something that was far away or distant. It was something that was personal to me, like a friend, like someone I could have a relationship with. And they said, reflect on this piece of scripture, not as a Bible passage, but as the word of God. So what is God trying to say to you through this Bible passage? And um, the first piece of scripture that was put in front of me um, after three years away from the church was, St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, which was my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. And I remember hearing it and it was just like a lightning bolt just hit me. And then the second part of the passage was, therefore I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may be able to rest upon me. Wow. And um, I didn't know. And people often ask me with my um, testimony and stuff like that, what if we don't have that massive experience? The thing is I didn't know it was a massive experience at that time. Later. Like, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I look back and then, yeah, like, praise God. I just see all the ways that he's worked in my life and um, really reflecting on the dumb decision that I made to be able to um, get into that fight and make really bad decisions and not dealing with my grief of my dad passing away with the right and healthy way that I should have. And um, how, like, my mistakes, God can really turn anything to good if we give him the chance to. So... That um, moment, I thought, okay, I'll just give this faith thing a try. And then six months after it, um, there was another boy that was kinked in King's Cross and um, he ended up dying and we were the same age. And then this huge thing came out, um, which was about alcohol fuel violence and the lockout laws. And it was just very strangely how it was positioned because um, a lot of people knew my family and um, this family who had gone through such pain as well and... Um, had very similar circumstances. We'd finished school at the same time. Um, It just coincided and um, I was able to have some amazing opportunities there through founding conviction group, working with the Thomas Keller Youth Foundation and um, just really just meeting these victims who had gone through um, these these kind of situations as well and has lost loved ones. So I think in that time um, and being able to look back on it now, I've been very privileged to be able to be here. How I ended up in this role was actually at um, World Youth Day in Poland where you saw me speak. You shared pretty much the same story and it, it never keeps, yeah. it never stopped having the same impact on me as, as when it first did because um, this terrible thing happened to you and I think all of us um, have a tendency when bad things happen is to, to maybe mope around like you did and not all of us have someone there to, to set us on the right track but when, when you realise that there was more to life rather than complain about what happened to you, you, you did something about it and you, you helped co-found the, the conviction group, which yeah. 
the work you guys did there is helping young people do what exactly? So we were working with um, young men um, specifically and it was around the kind of idea about starting conversation mm. around um, young men's health issues that they may face. So things like body image um, are things that people wouldn't associate for something that young men or teenage um, guys have to deal sure, with. Yeah. Um, but I think at the last needle exchanges, um, statistics that they were looking at was that the there was a huge increase and um, that when they asked him the questionnaire for um, when they did the um, kind of changing of the needle exchanges and stuff like that, it was an interesting study um, and they said um, steroid was by far, steroids was by far the um, largest amount of, um, you know, illicit drug that was used or performance enhancing drug that was used. So the idea um, that body image was just something that young uh, women faced mm -hmm. was also really confronting mental health. Um, three out of four suicides are men, and then um, I think two out of four are young men. Yeah. So uh, learning about that in that space, and then you just realised um, when we were looking at these things, a lot of these issues really stemmed back to the idea that um, young guys don't really have a way to be able to um, talk about things. Mm. They don't, a lot of them don't have a fatherly figure as well. And then just gets bottled up until it, it explodes. And, you know, I recently yeah. spoke with, with John, one of the guys on your team, about... Um, you know, letting these things out and letting our bodies feel how our souls are feeling in, in a healthy way so it doesn't, you know, build up and explode in alcohol fuel violence and things like that. So yeah, um, it's incredible work that you, you guys are doing. And um, since then, you went on to share about your work and conviction, this testimony at World Youth Day, you got this job in the diocese. Um, what are some of the things that you noticed when you came into this role in the diocese that um, maybe weren't right and some things that you wanted to, to make a difference in? Yeah. I was really lucky, like the um, the guys that came before me, I've got a lot of respect for um, in their role and their capacity. They did an amazing work. And a lot of them um, I was able to meet up with before and be able to talk about it. Okay. I guess in the space which we were working in, um, I it, the, what they were asking in the sense was to be able to move to more of a decentralised model of youth ministry. So to be able to see what we could do to be able to equip our leaders. Um, so things have changed over time. Um, I think a big one which I tried to um, be able to incorporate a bit more was kind of um, working in the sense of just starting with the um, basics with our young people, which is things like prayer, community, hospitality. Mm. One of the things that I've really um, seen with the, um, with in the being in this role is how much we can learn from churches in the sense of um, maybe not just Catholics, but also um, things like Alpha, you know, and seeing the way that they approach their ministry. I think one of the things that we struggle with um, with youth ministry is that it's still seen as a volunteer, volunteer kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and until we move our mindset to know this is something worth investing into in regards to resources, money, getting someone that's able to be in that role full time, I think that's really where things will change. Um, because the way that we should see our ministry isn't something that's kind of like an add on to our work. So if we have a professional job and we're professional in that work, so we're able to set our KPIs and grow and stuff like that. We should do the same thing when it comes to our ministry. It's just as important, you know. Um, so whether you're an accountant and you do youth ministry on the side, um, it really should be approached with the same mind mindset in the sense of um, professionalism, planning, and um, just being clear with your vision, you know. A big thing that we realised is that um, a lot of people talked about burnout um, in regards to youth ministry, but... I think for me, there wasn't much of an understanding to try and figure out why this burnout occurred. Mm. And really um, what we came to was that a reason why a lot of our youth leaders burn out is really because of isolation. Like that's the big thing. A lot of them feel like they're alone um, and then they're doing their ministry. And then when they're coming up these hurdles, they don't have someone to be able to go and talk to, to be able to say, mm. what should I do in this next part? So being able to create some sort of community and hospitality that we're all in this together um, was really um, a shift which I thought that um, we could move into a bit more. So, yeah. Um, I don't know about you, but I feel like in a lot of, a lot of dioceses around Australia especially, um, there's a lot of women that are involved in those roles of youth ministry, um, but maybe not so much men. Is that something that you noticed when you came to Sydney as well? Yeah, well, I think just in the church in general, um, like if you go to a weekday mass or if you go even to a weekend mass, you'll see that there's so many um, women there, but we're like kind of looking for where our um, lay men are, you know, and the gift that um, lay men can bring to the church in regards to 
if a father and um, his wife go to mass with their children, it's more likely that the children are going to keep practicing once they get older. And the gift that they have to be able to um, push through with our ministry, just, you know, men in the world, but that are just so faith filled and um, willing to be able to serve the church. Mm. So it, it has been something, and I think it's something that um, if we have more um, young guys, just middle of the road guys who um, love the church, love, um, you know, maybe even just having a barbecue or going out and having a beer and watching the footy, um, but they also love their faith. It would be an amazing thing to see um, what that would do for ministry. I know for myself, a lot of my friends um, probably think that church people are a certain way, yeah. you know, so they don't see themselves, they don't identify, they can't relate. Mm. But a lot of them, because they see me there and they see how much um, – I love the church and I love my faith. Mm. Um, they're a little bit more open to it, you know, mm. because they know me and they're like, oh, no, Chris isn't like that. He's not. Yeah. And it's one of those things that Fulton Sheen talks about where he says, um, nobody hates the Catholic church. People hate what they think they know they about know the church. About it, yeah. So we've got a really um, big job. That's been my experience. I said I was never becoming Catholic. And yeah. Here I am. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, I think for it, though, like God uses us um, – even with our um, way to be able to get to that point of surrender in our faith, like I'm not sure what it was like for you, but it, it's sometimes a hard conversion and a long conversion. Um, but once we get to that surrender, we're just you just feel so free, you yeah. know, um, so you can talk about it. Yeah, because you, you think you realise it's like, well, maybe I don't know everything. Right? Yeah. That's definitely a liberating thing. Um, and see, so yeah, we definitely need more, more men in the church. Um, but you have a house of, of young men exactly like that. You know, you run a house where guys come together to discern and what it is that God's calling them to in their life. Do you want to share a bit about that? Yeah, so uh, Sumner House is a house of the sermon and it was um, set up by Archbishop Anthony um, and Bishop Anthony um, Randazzo. Mm. So it's really a um, built on three pillars, which is basically community life, prayer life, yeah. and then also growing in um, formation and brotherhood. Yeah. Okay, so... In that sense, um, it's really great to be able to live there with the guys and to be able to see their growth over the last 12 months um, because it's really chalk and cheese the different people that they are. Um, one of the things that living in community life does is that it kind of rough, it kind of smooths out your rough edges right. um, because in nine different guys living in a house, you're all different personalities. You're going to rub for <laughs> sure. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And you kind of learn more about yourself because then you stop and then you're living with people that you've never met before from all different walks of life. And the big thing that the house makes you take on is not just the idea of um, taking on formation and stuff like that, but questioning why you think a certain way. Mm. So why is this annoying me? Um, why wasn't I able to get up at this time? And the accountability that you have to your brothers, you can't um, slack off or if you're trying to really grow in virtue, um, it's really hard to be able to look at another man in the eye who you respect and um, lie mm. and but also say um, then that um, you fell short. But in falling short, we have the ability to try again, um, but it's the accountability to know that we actually have to try. Yeah. I love that. You've created a culture amongst these guys where yeah, you're not just allowing them to, to live with their, their shortcomings, I guess, and, and their blind spots, but you're encouraging them to, to fight it out and wrestle these things through, which I think is super inspiring. And a while ago, I was, at, I was at Mass and um, I was in this church and I was, I was a little bit disappointed that there were no young people there. Mm. And I was like, what's going on? And um, after communion, I was just sitting there in silence and we just started going to this church because of COVID, the Emmanuel community wasn't having Mass and um, that's where we usually would go. And the Lord just said to me very quietly, like, um, I have some work for you to do here. And I was like, oh, sugar. <laughs> what does that mean? And I kind of put it off for quite a long time. Um, but eventually I just met up with the parish priest and I said, you know, this is, this is, this is the word I heard in Mass. And I'm really passionate about young people. These are my gift set. You know, I can play music. I, I can run youth groups and things like that. And um, he was like, all right, let's get it going. Um, and we just started doing these things. And, and next year I'm going to actually be working in this parish as a, as a youth ministry coordinator. Um, I don't really have the time for it. Um, but I've got the passion for it and I'm, I'm sick of complaining about it and so I'm going to do something about it and I think that's something that I, I see in you. But something that's often a little bit, it's hard to put your money where your mouth is and actually do it. Um, but I think you do it really well. What are some things that you found useful in, in not becoming a cynic, not seeing all these things that are wrong in, in the world, in the church and with men and the guys in your house, but, but believing that change is possible and there is a future? And what are some things that you've done to actually make a difference? I think the biggest thing that I've um, learned is the freedom to be able to choose, you know, and um, knowing that 
God gives us free will to be able to answer his call wherever he might be calling us to be able to do mission, to be able to spread the gospel. Um, and the other thing I realised over my time is that it's very easy to critique, but it's harder to create something, you know. Yeah. So everyone feels like they say, oh, you should have done this differently or you should have done this differently. And I think in the church as well, um, if you're going to go into ministry or if you're going to push against culture, if you're going to try and change something, you need to be able to understand that a lot of the times the people that you think um, should be on your side might be the ones that are actually making it a bit difficult for your ministry. Mm. But in understanding that, you realise that this is just a barrier that's going to come up, but you just move through it. You know, like I remember hearing a story about um, this parish and they wanted, or some of the parishioners wanted to run just uh, tea and coffee after mass to be able to allow some hospitality to happen. Mm. And then they said, no, it can't happen um, because we don't have any um, kettles or we don't have any um, cups. And they said, okay, no worries. Um, we'll go buy out the body. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And they said, no, you can't do it because um, that's our table and you can't use the table. So they went and got a table, you know. So there's always going to be this um, barrier. And through that, it's actually quite um, nice because you grow in your kind of faith because, you know, no matter what happens through this and um, God's given you a specific mission to be able to follow through no matter how big or how small it might be, but you just stay committed to that, Mm. you know. And I am... I've seen it a lot and I think to the young people um, that are listening, like I remember once I was told um, be the church, create the church that you, or something, let me get it straight. It was be the change in the church that you want to have or something like that. It was Yeah, be the change you want to see in the world. Or yeah, yeah, but he based it on the, the church. church. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a like Gandhi quote. Right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, cool. Well, maybe. <laughs> yeah. But it was basically on the premise of if if you want to do something, you go ahead and do it, you know. Yeah. And if you can't do it, find out why. Yeah. And find out what you can do. Um, yes. I've literally just started reading, started reading church documents to find out whether these these things that I want to do and that people are saying I can't, see whether they're, they're right. And exactly. if they are, hey, maybe I don't know everything like we were talking about before. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think there's a lot for us to learn about the ways that you've just persevered through through hard times and those ladies that wanted to have that, Tea and coffee, yeah, that's you know, right. buy a kettle and cups and a table. Um, there's heaps there for you guys to choose through. We're just about out of time, Chris. We're no, so grateful you. for you coming on. Thank you, Zach. Thanks for the work you're doing. And please join us next week for another slice of pizza. Thanks, guys. Shalom World brings to you the Catholic faith. In all its different dimensions, it can be a faith to inspire you in, in your own living of your Catholic life in society. Salon World offers you an opportunity of being rich and strengthened in your family life. We live in a culture that needs to have a Catholic presence. We live in a culture that needs to be evangelized by the presence of Catholic teaching and the inspiration to live according to our Catholic way of life. I recommend to you you're involved to be involved in the work of Shalom World. May the Lord bless you and bless the work of Shalom World. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.